Hey everyone, welcome to the fifth edition of the Formula E Addicts podcast. I'm Edward Hunter, I'm with Jack Jordimana, Jack Pickering, and our very special guest, Team Aguri Principal, Mark Preston. So, introduce yourselves guys, starting with Jack. Um, hello, as most of you know me, I'm from the Formula E website, uh, Formula E Zone. Um, so yeah, I don't need any much further introduction, you guys know me pretty well by now. Uh, Pico. Yeah, hi, I'm back. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> And I'm Ed, I'm the head admin of the Formula E Addicts Facebook page and Twitter page. I just turned 20 the other day, which is a, a big yeah, milestone I'm, in my uh, life. Joining and, the um, like me. <laughs> we, uh, we will have applause in the background and everything at this bit. <laughs> yeah, I, I, there's still a lot of cake downstairs that needs eating up, so that's, that's ongoing business. <laughs> but I don't want to focus too much on me, because obviously we've got our very special guest, as I mentioned, Team Aguri Principal Mark. So, um, Hi there, how are you? Good, thanks. Good to be um, on here on here with you guys. Yeah, we're very very lucky to ha- to have you on, and it was really nice of uh, Keith Smout, the commercial director, to organise this for us. And uh, I know you're obviously very busy, you know, with a lot of things that need to be sorted out before Beijing. So um, we're lucky we're working on a Sunday afternoon, so we're all in in the office at the moment. <laughs> ah, it must be a it must be a really nice uh, family atmosphere at Team Maguri because obviously it's one of the there's no real big manufacturer involved, but it's a, it's a t- it's the same group of people that's been there ever since the F1 days, isn't it? It, it is indeed. In six. Yeah, yes, indeed. It's taken us a while to get back into racing as, well, Super Aguri or Team Aguri now, but um, yeah, it's a, there's a lot of the same people involved. So what I find quite interesting is that in F1, you were the um, technical director for Super Aguri, and now, obviously, and obviously um, Agu- Mr. Aguri was the team principal, and now it seems that you're the team principal, and Mr. Guri is basically just the owner. With the, he's got the name on the door. So how exactly did that come about? Well, I think when, when we um, finished up with uh, Formula One, obviously a lot of the car companies pulled out of Formula One, as you know, and many of the Japanese businesses, such as Bridgestone, um, also pulled back when there was the crash. So um, I'd been looking at other ways of getting in back into motor racing or international motor racing. Guri still runs his... Super GT team in Japan and has done for 20 or so, or so years where he runs um, some of the Honda NSXs in that, in that series. Um, we were looking at what would be the next, next thing and I went off around the world and had a look at things like um, Silicon Valley and went to Detroit and a few places to see what we thought was going to be the future of kind of our favourite industry and um, came across Formula E a few years ago when, when the FIA was first put out to tender for electric race cars. Um, I pitched to manufacture all the cars, but at the same time, uh, I think Alejandro was pitching to do the entire series, so everything from supplying the cars to, to promoting it. And um, when he, uh, let's say, popped up on the scene, we rang him up and said, could we be involved? And he said, bring a Guri and we'll, we'll see how what we can do. So um, I uh, wanted to be team principal at that point and... Peter McCool was um, the technical director in the first in the first year, and um, we've kind of all moved up all moved up one level. So uh, it's sort of my chance to do to run the team. And a very good job you do of it as well. In fact, you've already had some early success in for me winning at Buenos Aires with Antonio Felix da Costa last season. So tell us a little bit about that and sort of the first season in general, maybe. The first, I mean, the first season, we're a little bit late to start, and uh, we, we, we didn't sort of build You wouldn't off. be the only one, say, Mark. <laughs> uh, well, we didn't build off an existing team, which some of them, some of the guys um, could, for example, um, Andretti's or Edam's, who were building off the back of their other programs in GP2 and other series. So we kind of started from scratch. Um, that took us a little while to get it all going, but um, we didn't have as good testing as we would have liked because of that in the pre-season and so in the first few races we struggled a bit but then in Punta del Est which was um, before the Christmas um, break we uh, had a first test uh, for, well not our first test but certainly the first test that really Antonio and Salvador had done properly and really found a lot of time in the car because there, Salvador so. had only just joined the team then as well exactly so he had his sort of first day in some ways to really fully run uh, run a test and and then in the next race, basically, it paid off. We were able to take all of the ideas from the test, which was 
the day after Punta del Est and um, put that all together. I remember Antonio in the uh, sort of the pre, um, in the, the practice sessions in the morning saying to me, look, if we can get in the top seven, we can win the race from there. Um, we turned out to be um, top eight and uh, he went into the race pretty confident that there was so much uh, carnage and craziness in this series, as you know, that uh, he was pretty confident of being on the podium and lo and behold, he was. That was so, good fun. Yeah. Very race, good fun. Best race of the year, in my opinion, and I'm, yeah. and I'm not being biased at all. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but, but, but I do think that Buenos Aires, in my eyes, was probably the best race of the year. It just had everything. And it's a good track too, actually. I think the drivers really enjoyed that track. More of a race track than some of the others. So, but I think also that when, when everyone first arrived in Beijing, if you have a look back now at some of the driver changes and you sort of watch the video as the drivers get out of the car and into the next car, and then you have a look at, let's say, how Antonio switched cars in, in the last race he was in. It's, it's a world away. A so, Moscow. Yes. <laughs> so everyone, they sort of dance now as they jump out of the car and into the other car, whereas um, in the first one you can sort of see Takuma kind of getting out and not wandering over but not going super fast between the two cars. And we're, it's a really big difference between the first race. So I think even Beijing this year will be different. Well, it might have been a different uh, time limit as well because you remember we saw Edams get that horribly wrong in Moscow. They thought they had to wait That was rather longer. funny. That <laughs> a was little. It, we, we also made that same mistake in, um, well, we made it slightly differently in Long Beach as well. We were holding um, Antonio for 10 seconds extra because we'd got that number wrong um, from the pit entry to the exit. There, there's, a, there's a chance that that'll change in the future, so we'll be just down to how fast the drivers can switch between cars. I'm not exactly sure when we're introducing that. Or it could be, I believe it's um, season five when they're talking about getting rid of the driver changes altogether. I hope so. I mean, it's it's interesting when people say, how long will it be until you can do the race with one car? I think one of the big problems is that you probably could do it now if you had the infrastructure, which is that you could have inductive, inductive charging in the road if you really wanted to. Um, and if you had four-wheel drive, four-wheel regeneration, you could probably get back a reasonable amount of the battery power already. It's just that that's a bit expensive for where we are in, in the development roadmap. Yeah. I thought it was a cost issue because there was a. I read about a meeting um, quite recently that was about the development direction that Formula E was going in. I'm not sure if you were involved in that in any way or if anyone from Team Aguri was, but it seems that they. Because uh, I heard John Todd before then was going on about how he wanted to push that a bit earlier, and now it sort of seems to have been, oh, okay, season five is okay then. <laughs> I think it, it, a, a lot could change. I mean, every. It's pretty amazing that we've actually got this series off the ground. And when you sort of think of what we've done, we've gone to completely different places. Um, when nobody had been to racing in places like Punta del Este and we're in cities, which make it sort of more difficult in some ways because you've got to mm. um, negotiate with local councils. I understand that Miami, they had something like 160 permits they had to get from seven different counties because that area of Miami crosses over a, a number of county borders and therefore, just, that sort of thing has never really had to be done in the past. So there's a lot of difficulties in setting up a season. I think once we get going again in season two, um, you never know with motor racing. It could all accelerate at a great rate if um, one of the car companies decides that they, they've got the technology and would potentially like to share the batteries, for example, like Tesla does with their um, open source uh, IP. It's interesting. I have to get back to you a bit on Tesla because one of the questions that we got sent in by fans, and we got nearly a dozen or so questions, which was really good. One of them is about concerns Tesla. Before we move on to those, uh, Jack, do you have any questions? Because I know that Pico and I have not let you get a word in edgeways so far. So, well, I barely said anything either. Well, oh, sorry. No, but, uh, no, no, Jack, go on. No, it's just a. Uh... I've only got a few questions, really, because uh, me and Mark, we spoke, uh, we've met, we've spoken testing. Um, but, you know, we're going towards Beijing now. Like, you know, how are preparations? Because obviously going into Beijing last season, you know, it was a sort of open, OK, what could happen? You might have had an idea, but, you know, this year you've actually learned stuff from last year. So don't, those things that you've learned, how are you putting it into your preparations? What did you learn? And how is that, you know, making the preparations better so you could be more competitive going into Beijing? So we, we've been doing a lot of testing um, up at Donington, as you know. Um, we've also got a simulator program now. 
There's a lot of a lot of changes coming up due to the change in peak power you're allowed to use in the race. So it's going to come down a lot more to the driver now. Um, we have pretty much the same amount of laps and the same battery. So therefore, if you're allowed to use more power in the race, you're going to have to save more power as well. So the driver training really is one of the biggest things. I suppose, uh, without being blasé about it, the normal, let's say, motor racing preparation goes on um, regardless. Um, everything from just understanding every little piece of the car. Um, we've got a few new uh, sensors on the car and we're running some new software, which we developed in the, the pre-season. Those things are all different. In the first year, everything was fixed, but now we're able to um, work on our own um, software. So that's one of the big things. But, yeah, the biggest thing that's different to any other racing series is really management of, elect- uh, of the power and teaching the driver better um, how they should use that power. So getting all that sort of stuff prepared is one of the biggest things. Um, so obviously with Amlin and Dre now, because you were the only team at the beginning to use last season's powertrain, now Amlin and Dre have reverted. Um, in terms of, obviously at the beginning of the season you could be fairly competitive because we've seen the reliability issues that are tested. We've seen, you know, obviously we've had a month where teams could try, but they haven't, well, you can't touch the cars now, they can only learn from the data, they can't actually touch the car till we get to Beijing because they're all travelling as we speak. Um, but do you feel like Amelie and Andretti will now become your main challenges, like, you know, they're the team that you want to beat? And do you feel like maybe because, you know, we talked about the software optimization, and obviously Andretti haven't had as much time as you have, so, is, you know, is that the team that you feel like we need to beat them in a way? Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's a, that's a natural competitor now. And then I think the two of our teams have to then go out and beat everybody else as well. <laughs> um, yeah. I think um, we proved that, uh, as I said to you, we proved at McLaren back in 2003 that, you can take a, a year-old car, do some work to it, and be very competitive in that season. We came first, I think it was, in the first few races, actually, and building up a good points gap at the beginning while everybody else is trying to get their reliability is is our number one target. Um, so we have to sort of come out of the box better than anybody else with less problems and just focus on delivering at the first few races There'll be a natural gap over over Christmas, and I imagine we'll probably test in Punta del Este just like we did um, in the first year. So those first three races, we have to take as much advantage as we can. Um, Software we can still continue working on, and I think everybody will be trying to figure out how to use these batteries to to their maximum. There's a few little changes in the batteries, but the power usage may throw up some also some problems for for everybody um and the batteries being the same size even the some of the new cars will have to have a quite a lot of efficiency gain to to beat us let's say so qualifying yeah. is still 200 kilowatts and it's a one lap um shootout and therefore it'll really come down to how prepared the drivers are um as long as we don't make any mistakes for the team the drivers have got to do one lap, get it right, and that's pretty hard. You'd have to go back and look at last year and figure out how many of the drivers actually got their fast time on their first lap or their second lap. I'd say everybody was second lap. So yeah. if you looked at the people's first laps out, you'd probably find a bit of um, knowledge on who's good at you know going out and setting a time. So that's a huge one, and that, so it's not, that won't really come down definitely to the car itself. Not always, anyway because the, car, the cars themselves are not um, going to be that much different in terms of mechanical setup, and aerodynamically they're pretty much exactly the same, so that tyres are the same as well. So uh, really it's going to come down to how well a driver can come out of the box and, and deliver in qualifying. Speaking of drivers, it's very much the elephant in the room here, I think, because <laughs> we've seen all the other teams have announced their drivers pretty early on, a lot of stable lineups. there's even the surprise of Jack Villeneuve being in there, but we we had a, I've heard a lot of different rumours about who the two seats at Team Maguri have gone to. So um, have I, you signed anyone? <laughs> we, we 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 don't we don't need names. I just want to know whether you have or haven't. We're finalising yeah. contracts today. Oh, okay. okay. Interesting. Well, okay. We're, we're really we have everything sorted out this week. Do you think okay. there will be an announcement later this week, or is it you know you're going to wait closer to Beijing? I know you have to announce no, a few weeks before now. 
Yeah, well, you've got to remember we've got Fan Boost, haven't we? So <laughs> Fan Boost opens, I think, in two weeks two weeks before the start of the race. And it so, continues um, six, day, six minutes into the race, not six days. <laughs> yeah, it continues six days into the race. Isn't the... We're not that slow. No, I can't, I can't do quick maths in my head. 146 hours of, hours of Beijing or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> so... I think by that point they'd be too tired and they sort of wake up in the middle and like, oh, I got fan boost. Oh, but I'm way too tired to drive right now. <laughs> so we're in time for fan boost anyway. Yeah, we're in time for fan boost. Splendid. Well, my final question for me before I hand over to the boys for their questions is obviously the FIA, they've said like there's going to be some track changes at basically all the, virtually most of the events this season. So uh, have you been told, we you know, what's changing at Beijing? It's um, the first chicane, isn't it, Jack? I believe so, but I just wanted the clarification. I've um, there's been a CAD drawing arrived, but I haven't really looked at it carefully. The guys on the simulator have been working on it. Um, I'm trying to think which which corners were difficult last year. Was was that the corner p- most people had trouble with? Well, the last corner was very tight, so I was interested to see if the last corner had some sort of adjustment. Well, we all remember what happened at the last yeah. corner, of course. <laughs> yes. And, uh, yeah, and they, did, they, there was talk about the first corner chicane, or maybe some of the chicanes later on down the I street. Think so. I think some of those chicanes will change slightly because, if I remember rightly, when people bounce over one curb, it, they were naturally forcing you into the barrier. I think there'll be some slight changes in the chicanes, I would say, to make it easier to go quicker through those um, and keep the excitement level and not have as many crashes, I would imagine. Yeah. So what I heard about from, uh, I think it was an article on motorsport.com, was that the only real change, at Beijing at least, was that they were going to, get rid of it was either they were going to get rid of or bulldoze the first chicane i was pretty sure I they said i believe it's get rid i believe it's get rid of the first chicane but i think that's interesting because get... that means it's going to be a much longer straight yeah. there yeah, yeah. I, th- I i think they should have got rid of the second chicane on the straight after because because there, there's two chicanes on yeah. on that little straight there's the there's the bus stop one which i would have kept but there's one before that which i don't see the point of so yeah i would have got rid of that one instead but i but but uh, but i I do not control tracks as much as I, I, I would love to. Um, <laughs> I don't control how the track layouts are and everything. Well, you've been you've been playing at it on Root Builder, though. We all know. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I think we had a. We'll go up to a bit more of our questions a bit later on. Just just the other ones that are rolling around in our heads right now. But um, let's go on to our marked questions for Mark Preston, and I'll go right head straight into oh, the first one. Yeah, that could be... <laughs> I know, sorry, I, I can hear people cringing in the background. <laughs> that was just, I, I just cringed when you said that. I know, I, I felt that I have to, I've been listening to a lot of other Formula E podcasts and they have a lot of, you know, really cringeworthy titles for their segments, so I figured that that's a trend we have to adopt now in order to be popular. <laughs> uh, anyway, so can the first... Can, uh, can, the title for, can the title for this podcast be Now With Experts? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Tyler's going to end up being four people talk about things that aren't formulae. <laughs> <Right. laughs> so, um, first question is from Tim Salt, and it is, what is your opinion of the new rules that will be in effect for Season 2, and will the increased power to 170 kilowatts help you more than the last season? Hmm, I, I mean, I think it's going to be more difficult. The 170 kilowatts will just make it more difficult for the drivers. If you looked at um, PK, as we all did in... London, he did a great job of managing energy. Um, I think it's going to make it more difficult. So imagine that before you had 150 kilowatts peak and you still had to do things that we call it lift and coast. So at the end of the straights, mm. you lift a bit earlier just before braking, and that's because that's where you save the most energy. Um, now you've got 170 kilowatts, but you've got the same battery power. That means you probably want to use more power out of the corner. So when you're going slower, but you're going to have to save more. So the 170 kilowatts is going to make it more difficult for the driver, although the lap times should be quicker. Um, I'd say they'll probably be maybe half a second to a second quicker, um, but it depends on how much they have to save in um, in each lap. So that, that part of it will be interesting. And then obviously the qualifying now is really down to the one lap, and of course people can make mistakes on that one lap and... It'll come down to who's one of the most competitive in terms of one lap, like the old days in F1 where you, <laughs> most people went out in the last dying two minutes of the qualifying session. So it'll be a lot more like that. Uh, 
five cars, I think it is, isn't it, in yeah, the Super Pole? So yeah. um, there's very limited time, and so qualifying will be very key. But then, as we found this year, there'll be a lot of uh, changes in position as people make mistakes on the um, the energy usage. Uh, you mentioned uh, PK Junior there. One of the things that Admiral Nelson was... Re- what? No, it's Nelson P. Gaging. Sorry, that's just my nickname for him. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> One of the things that Nelson was um, really good at doing last year was um, he uh, staying out of that extra lap. Uh, do you think that's going to be more important, the fact, with, considering the fact that we've got the same batteries and uh, we're using up... Well, there's a, the 170 kilowatt limit that we've gone up to. Do you think um, it's going to be more important staying the extra lap, or do you think it'll not matter? I mean, extra lap is can be advantageous depending on if you're being held up um in a in a train um it's always better to go longer if you can uh, that's always seems to be the to be the number one um gives you more options on the second car so i think if you can if you are stuck in a train let's say and you can't open up a big gap then yeah it is better to save as much as you can go one lap, then you get an extra, then you've got more power in your second car, effectively, and um, you can go faster because you're, you've got a clean lap. That's the idea. So but then things still... don't always go to plan if the stop doesn't go very quickly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, But, in, you know, if it goes to plan, then theoretically that's still one of the quickest ways to, to do the race, unless you're at the front. Because if you're at the front, it's always best just to do the optimum, whatever that optimum is. Um, but if you're stuck behind slower cars for some reason they're not doing such a good job on energy usage, then you really want to save, let them go in, and then you take that extra lap, go as quickly as you can, and then the second car, you've got slightly better power. Um, And you maybe jump a few people in the pit stops, and then you've got a bit more power to overtake. So could you do the next question, please, Pico? Yeah, okay. Uh, Freaky Dan Freakly has commented (laughs) in to ask you, do you think mainstream F1 fans will start to head over to Formula E now that F1 has so many restrictions and Formula E is effectively improving on power and therefore fun? His first name isn't actually Freaky. I just added that in for for this because I thought it would be funny. (laughs) Sorry, Dan. uh, It's interesting. Um... I mean, I think the races in the first year in Formula E were pretty exciting, except especially, you know, London, the far last race. Um, I usually except tell people... Except Monaco. To... Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think I tell people to watch that last race because when people are out of position, it always makes it more fun. So the, the fact that the qualifying is going to be more difficult, less room for error, um, you will naturally get people out of place at each racetrack. And by doing that, mistakes always make for more exciting racing so it depends on what people are looking for if they're looking for technological development then um we haven't got certainly as much resource as f1 has but we're always trying to uh, work on changing things in formula e i think people will slowly get to feel um that there is a lot of exciting things going on in formula e but it'll take a little while to get to that level of technological development that um, f1 has you said you didn't like the third question, well, yeah, Jack. I was going mo- to move on to the fourth question. Oh, you can do the fourth one because um, that's more interesting. Uh, so the fourth one is sort of the Tesla question and it's also with some other manufacturers. It says, do you think the likes of Tesla, Rimic, BMW or Porsche, because they've all been in talks of, you know, maybe in the future turning up to Formula E, um, do, you think do you think they will come over to Formula E is the question and how much crossover is there between Formula 1 slash WEC hybrid development and Formula E? And that comes from Tony Shorthouse. Well, I can start with the the sort of easier question about the Formula One WEC because uh, Williams did the battery for Formula E in the first year and it'll be the same, very similar battery in the second year with some upgrades. That is, uh, I think the history of that battery was it did start with their curse system in Formula One and they've developed that through the CX-75 with Jaguar um, and then into Formula E. So the effect on Formula E is reasonably big from Formula 1 um, it probably will become more so from WEC in the future I would say as people do more electrical power I understand that maybe some of the manufacturers are going to redesign their cars soon because the Porsche was obviously um, pretty quick this year yeah. um, and it, it, I believe it has more electrical power than some of the others 8 megajoules compared to the 4 of the others of yeah. the Toyota so I, you've got to say that the that the others will go that way, they'll follow the 
what Porsche has done. I think the electrical power is more beneficial because of the torque control, basically. Um, one of the big problems in an internal combustion engine is that it's that you've got is the control part of it. That's what's so good about electrical motors is because of the control that it gives you. The internal combustion engine at the moment is more power just because the energy density of fuel is so much higher than uh, batteries at the moment. I don't know whether batteries will ever get quite to the same level as um, fuel, but we may come up with other creative ways of not having to have so much energy on board. For example, induction charging in the roads. Um, so, yes, there is a big um, effect uh, from Formula One and WEC on the series. What about people like Tesla and will it be relevant? I think, well, they've just announced their Model X, haven't they, this yes. week? That was, um, I haven't actually watched it yet, the announcement, but that's another, they're, they're expecting to sell a lot more cars in that in that um, area. Um, as time goes on and more manufacturers come into the series, we will make more gains uh, in the technology. Um, we're learning every every day, I suppose. Um, there's not many people, we've been talking to a lot of people around the world about how to understand the batteries better and there's not a huge amount of knowledge in how to push a battery as far as we are in motor racing and I mean historically motor racing has always pushed things well over the limit in comparison to to road cars just normal development and naturally you take more risk in racing so that's one of the reasons why you make um, development so the, theoretically with the new Porsche Mission, Mission E I thought that was quite a nice car at the yeah. Frankfurt Motor Show. I would have liked to have seen that in the real, in in real life. That actually looks like it's a, let's say the new target. You know, Tesla was the, let's say the, the target everyone had. I think once that Porsche comes out, and that'll be one of the big targets. And I think Audi had a, an e-tron as well, didn't they? Yeah. So once those high-level cars come out, they'll be the new targets. And um, I could imagine that BMW will do some sort of upgrade soon i imagine there'll be in something either in between the i3 and the i8 or maybe something above the i8 i'm not quite sure where they'll bring one out there but um they i think they will all come because they'll all like to compete in motor racing to show their prowess and um there's a lot of development to happen in in electrical vehicles and motor racing will be one of those places what I found interesting was just, it's just the thing with Tesla, because Tesla have been, you know, they've asked, because they've sort of been the pioneers. They, You know, electric motors for them have been their niche. And now it's, you know, formerly and other manufacturers are starting to get in. And I, I feel like Tesla, they say they don't want to come into formerly, they don't want to compete. But then I thought like to myself, well, if you allow the other manufacturers to start competing and increasing their rate of development, that they could, you know, overtake Tesla. I think Tesla are in a bit of like a... You know, fifty-fifty. Like you know, they can't get left behind because it was, you know, it was Tesla for electric cars. If you fought electric cars, you fought Tesla. But soon you might, you know, think Nissan, Porsche, and suddenly Tesla are about the back of your mind. I think that that Porsche changed the game, in my opinion. That yeah. was um, that was a pretty big step because I didn't expect Porsche to come out with something so high end and so all encompassing. And and I think it also looks like that Porsche is a design direction for the future for the Porsche company. So therefore to kind of put everything into that, that one car. So if that car existed on the roads in the next year or so, which they could do fairly easily, um, then I can't see any reason why that wouldn't become the focus of everybody's minds. And, you know, BMW could easily do something similar uh, to that um, almost immediately, couldn't they? Because they already have the technology in the, in the i3 and the i8, so there's nothing to stop uh, BMW coming out with another car that, you know, copies that copies that Porsche, or maybe they've already got it on the drawing board and we don't know about it. Um, but uh, I definitely think that could change the game very quickly, those two cars. And it's also important to remember that Remac, the Concept 1, is basically one of the course cars at the moment as well, isn't it? It is indeed, yep. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure that they'll compete with the big guys, and I think that's why the Porsches of the world yeah, really took, took the limelight. And uh, this will move on to the next one. They're speaking of um, big uh, car companies, there's a lot in the news recently about VW and the emission scandal, and you had a lot to say about it yourself. And in this article I wrote, it was very interesting. You were talking about the demise of the diesel engine, basically, and how EVs were the future. And I thought that was a very bold claim, considering... 
basically the diesel engine we're so reliant on it not just in the car industry but also in the sort of agriculture boats all sorts of things so could you elaborate a bit more i i think that the future that we're talking about for electric cars is in mega cities so that cities above 10 to 12 million people that's london paris Buenos Aires, those kind of cities or places um, that have formula e races of course <laughs> exactly and so what we were talking about is what will the, where will be the first places that will be affected by the this discussion on diesel and i'm not sure if you know but many many of the big cities are talking already before this um before what happened with with vw about zero emission city centers so i think what what i was really saying was that somewhere like london and i mean you look at la back in, um, I think it was 10 or 15 years ago, when they talked about doing zero emission. And that's why the, we had that GM um, EV1, I think it was called. Uh, that's why that got created back in that time, because Los Angeles, with its really big smog problem, was talking about going zero emission in the cities. Now, that didn't happen, but it shows that one of the bigger cities in the world was considering that 10 or 15 years ago. And it's very easy to see that, you know, a, a city like London um, is talking about it. I believe Paris is, or has already been talking about it for a while now. The, the mayor there has um, been talking about zero emission or at least very high restrictions on the, the city centres. So I think that the, the VW discussion will just have an accelerating effect in some of those discussions that are already happening and you could imagine that if a government in one of those cities had already got it on the cards then this might just accelerate or catalyze the the change and i've always said that when one mega city does it then others will follow so if someone in china a city in china says we're going to make zero emission in beijing or, or another city maybe only in the you know the very very center of the city to begin with then it won't be long before somewhere in Germany will do it, somewhere in the UK will do it, somewhere in America will do it, and you'll start to be on a bit of a, uh, a snowball. So for me, it's just really waiting um, for a catalyst, and that's why we were saying that maybe this whole discussion will just move forward a couple of cities, and then you'll be, um, it'll, it'll be a snowball effect. Okay, that's really interesting. Mark, I'm not going to tell you who sent this. I just want... I, uh, You'll be able to know pretty quick. Yeah, yeah, because uh, but because I want you to guess who this is written by. Okay, the question is, why don't you pay your commercial director more money? <laughs> Who's that from, Mark? Yeah, he's sitting across. The, he's sitting across from me now, <laughs> he's waving at me. <laughs> I'm just going to. Is he waving that. a check at you? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist. He's brought sweets to our meeting today, so he's all right. <laughs> yeah, that's another that's another few months on his contract, surely. Exactly. <laughs> there was one we skipped earlier, which was from uh, Krzysztof Alexander Wozniak. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Well <laughs> How do I get a job with a Formula E team, especially in media? Where did we do we guess where he's he lives? I wonder. <laughs> um, there's a lot of you got to be in some ways. You got to be where all the teams are, which is most of the teams are in the UK. Um, certainly, the base up at Donington um, in media. Uh, you can always send your Talk CVs to, to everyone. Yeah, send your CV, and that always works because you never know what people are looking for. Yeah. And get experience um, doing things like what you guys are doing: podcasts and and um, interviewing people and running your own blog. It sounds like that's all the the way to go nowadays. Um, but when certainly. I was up at um, so, uh, so, sorry, when I was up at Donington um, for one of the test days, Jack uh, Jack Nichols just sort of got a bit. He, he he sounded like that he got bored after the first half an hour. So I did tweet him to say, uh, uh, do, "Do you need any help up in the commentary box? I'm I'm very happy to." Help. He didn't respond, <laughs> and, uh, and 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 so I asked him why in the uh, in the um, in the lunch break, and he still didn't ask me to come up. Maybe two jacks would have just gotten too confusing. I mean, who would do that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, too many jacks in the box. Yeah. And, um, yeah, but Jack Nichols, a very nice guy and commentator. Uh, the um, the company that does all the uh, broadcasts for me, Aurora Media Worldwide, uh, Krzysztof, if you're still looking for someone, those seem to be the people to ask for a media job because they handle a lot of the uh, 
Not so much the uh, social media side, but in terms of the broadcast side, that would definitely. I've asked them for a job, not got a response back yet, but hopefully, uh, <laughs> just got to keep, yeah, keep trying. Maybe exactly. send, do more podcasts with famous people like Mark. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, let's see. The next question is from one of our um, very dedicated users on the Facebook page, Matt Murphy, who's also been on the podcast in the um, third edition, I think. Uh, and he asks, "How do you intend to market a Japanese racing brand to people in the UK?" Oh, that's a complicated question, isn't it? <laughs> um, I think based off the history in in uh, F1 and racing, really, we're an international team. Um, I'm Australian. Uh, Guri's obviously Japanese. We have a very uh, international group in our in our team. So I don't really want to focus on one country. I think we're just our heritage is Japanese, obviously, because of Aguri, and this is the center of motorsport in the UK. So it's traditionally a lot of Japanese companies have actually run out of the UK and and, and do at the moment. For example, Honda um, does have its engine build shops in the in the UK and uh, work very closely with McLaren. And um, many of the touring car teams and other things have run out of here as well. So really, motor racing is international, and we have got a history of uh, being having Japanese team members, but we've also got team members from other parts of the world. So we're an uh, international racing team. Speaking well, of... Speaking well, of oh, well, sorry. Currently for, uh, currently for me, where, uh, where, where I live in Oxford, uh, I'm, I'm, current, I'm currently effectively in right bang in the middle of Motorsport Valley. There's Formula One factories all over the place, and, um, and there's a few touring car teams everywhere. So, yeah, the, the Oxfordshire area and around Silverstone around that sort of area is probably uh it's probably like the best place to find uh, any motorsports companies exactly speaking of japan what i wanted to know about was um you you and sakon Yamamoto recently went to tokyo didn't you for their little demo run how was that did like you, did he oh, crash was, was <laughs> no, he, didn't. he was going very Sorry. slowly and he got a lot of um he got a lot of tweets from his fans saying you're a bit slow um <laughs> because Basically, the police over there, it's, it's banned to race on roads. And it was only able to happen because they, we, we ran in this area called Rapongi, which is um, one of the sort of uh, city centre suburbs. And they got special permission from their prefecture, which is like their county, to, to run on the road. Uh, they, they're looking at changing what well, they are, trying to change the rule. I think it's actually in October uh, to allow road racing in particular circumstances, a bit like Switzerland's been doing with their with their rules um, to allow road racing. Um, it was really well attended. You know, the Japanese are really big fans of motorsport. And they're big fans of Formula E as well. There seems to be so much enthusiasm, especially, you know, Sakon does a lot of his work for TV, Ayashi as well. Yes, indeed. And I, I did see a report um, in the last few days, and I was just going to try and bring it up if I can do really fast as to how many people we actually had there or how much coverage it got. I think it was something like um, 15 or 20 million people watched the, watched the, the demo run in, um, in Japan. So it's uh, really popular. But motorsport is absolutely popular in, in Japan, and we have a lot, of, a lot of fans there. So it was quite a good, a good event. and got a lot of coverage, and that will help them to push quite hard to have a race in Tokyo in the future, I think that would be one of the most amazing races that could happen if, if they were able to get a, a race downtown Tokyo. Uh, so, um, do you think the evolution of Formula E cars will be used in the evolution of electric cars in the future? And what are your predictions when it comes to numbers of viewers and fans, maybe compared to F1? Do you think you know, it will still grow? And that comes from Macon Birkland. I think so. Um, motor racing... There's, a, there's something that, the, that NASA uses to describe the development of technology, and they call it technology readiness levels. And normally at the top of that, um, of those levels is when you deliver something to, the, to, the, to a customer. Um, and a lot of the experimentation gets, is, is hidden behind in the R&D centers of car companies as they work on their, their new cars. One thing about motor racing is, is that it's... Um, it is a uh, it's a test track out in the front of people. You know, I was talking to some people over the last few days about autonomous cars, and and oh, we were yes. talking about whether or not we should run autonomous in racing. And, and I actually think we should maybe do it, for example, under the safety car, because 
One of the one of the biggest um, problems about getting autonomous cars into the onto roads is, of course, people's uh, people being worried about it. And what better way than to get people used to autonomy um, as to run things on racetracks where it's basically safe. You could run at pit with a pit lane speed limiter kind of level of speed because really you don't have to go fast under the safety car. It's really just to keep the car... Especially with the full course yellows that are coming out as well in the new rules. Yeah, exactly. And you could have a um, follow me BMW. You've probably seen those videos where they have one car following another and the front car is driven by a race car and the ba- and the car behind is just follows the first car. Using it's, still a, it's still a very cars. unorthodox idea for a racing series though to implement that. Well, I was thinking about this morning, what do you need? Well, you need electric power steering, which is um, pretty common in road cars nowadays. Mm-hmm. We've got plenty of electricity on board to do that. If you run it under the if you run it under um, uh, pit lane speed limiter control, then you've got the car's speed controlled and then really it's the software that controls the throttle and um and um steering so and and brakes and the brakes are um can be done through regeneration so you'd have to start slowly you know in the first year that maybe it could only go around at 30 or 40 kilometers an hour just to make sure it worked properly um and then as time went on you could imagine the, the cars under the safety car being controlled completely at a higher speed so I see that motor racing should be the the place where you should be experimenting with ideas that later go into road cars. It's not just the experimentation part of it, but it's also gaining acceptance to, um, of the the consumers or customers as to those to those things working. So you know when race cars put seat belts in the cars, I think it's not just the fact that it made the car safer; it also made the person on the street say, "Oh, race cars have seat belts, so I'll wear a seat belt." So there's, a, yeah, there's certainly a lot to to you know making adoption um, adoption uh, quicker. One of the questions we've been sitting here today asking is, "Who should the target audience be?" Um, and you know that uh, Formula One's target or not, not target, but sorry, uh, main demographic is getting older by the day. Um, so I think Formula E really really needs to be focused on the the future that's you guys 20 year olds um (laughs) newly uh, made 20 year olds yeah yeah exactly um (laughs) because that theoretically you're the people will buy whatever the new cars are in the future and you're the people that will um will be encouraging autonomy maybe to happen or not happen um so whatever we do in formula e i think we need to target um a different audience in formula one and because we're racing in cities and because we're modern i mean one of the things I noticed at many of the races was that there was kids there. Um, a so, lot of families as well. Yeah, I mean, if you go to a Formula One race, it's quite, it's very noisy, obviously. That's that's one of the cells. Noisy, but, not as noisy as it used to be, obviously. Yeah, but maybe noisy again next year. And yeah. that puts off, you know, bringing five-year-olds and six-year-olds and things like that. Whereas Formula E, certainly in Battersea Park, had this in London. We had a lot of um, very young kids Maybe a lot of them were playing on the bouncy castles, but they also were watching the cars and and um, learning about electric vehicles. So I think it's up to us and yourselves to promote this in a different way, I think, than Formula One and not just just copy. So there's some exciting times ahead, and I think we have to find new ways. I mean, this fan boost will be interesting, won't it, to see how it goes in the race. Um, if the commentators play that well, I think that will be a really interesting race where we can vote for the for, for our own drivers. I'm not sure how we're going to do it in the pits. We'll have to figure that out, um, how we vote for our own drivers. Turn, uh, turn on 4G. Yes. <laughs> well, in some places, the problem at the racetrack is that you race in a place like Battersea Park, which is not used to having 40,000 people trying to make phone calls and down, download things on... Or when uh, it rains as well, on yes. top of that. Exactly. So, um, we'll have to have. Oh, our wasn't own that crazy? Link. We'll have to have our own secret link somehow. Yeah. Alejandro Gag said he expected the energy in the race car's batteries to be doubled in five years' time. Is the battery development really so promising, or do you think we'll have to wait a bit more before watching a race without cars swapping? Which battery technology will reach a goal? Graphene, lithium iron, or other? So I go a different way in this question. And this is from uh, Fulvio Bernard. 
the Roddy. <laughs> I don't. I don't think we should be looking at it in that in that way. Um, if you and again, we haven't done these calculations properly yet. But I um, some very quick calc. Some of the guys have been doing is how much can you regenerate? So let's get very technical here for a second. If you get a car up to say 150 kilometers an hour, or miles an hour, when you brake. Theoretically, you're just pushing all of that energy into heat in the brakes, and that's why they glow. Um, so all of that energy that you you use to get it up to 150 miles an hour is now just going out the door um, in in heat. If you can regenerate all of that energy or a proportion of that energy back into the battery, then theoretically you should be able to use all that energy to go up the next straight. And all the battery has to do is to get the car going and then to replace the lost energy. So that's the theory. But getting that energy back into the battery is one of the most difficult things. And so as development goes on, um, while we're not able to regenerate the levels we'd like to, so you need to be able to regenerate from the front wheels as well as the rear wheels, and we can't do that at the moment. But if we were able to regenerate everything from the front wheels, a little bit like some of the WEC cars, um, which can do more regeneration than we can, then over time, you won't need to double the battery. You may only have to go up by, say, one and a half. And then as time goes on, if you were to wirelessly charge the cars as they're moving, um, which has been some of the discussions, um, if you look on the internet, you'll see some ideas about making one yeah, lane. There was uh, Drayson, who used to work with Trulli, who um, originally yes. suggested that. Yeah, so you can see theoretically... If you wirelessly charge the car, you don't have to double the battery. So what I'm trying to say is it depends on which direction we go in in development. If we're able to do four-wheel drive, full regeneration, then maybe the current battery can do it by, t- by itself. Maybe it has to be a little bit bigger. Maybe it has to be one, one and a half, 1.25 times. Um, so the great, great thing about motor racing is we're not constraining ourselves to, say, double the size of the battery. We're just saying... We want to get rid of one of the cars. That's a different question. So going back to the the question, um, which technology in batteries? Yeah, I think most of the most people predict the batteries won't be changing at the the rate we need in terms of just pure chemistry. But we shouldn't think about that's what's great about motor racing. Don't constrain yourself by saying it has to be, it has to come from graphene or other uh, other technological developments. It's going to come from completely different thinking, and that's what we should be doing in motor racing, completely different thinking. And um, you never know, fuel cells might come in in the future as well. Uh, do you think it's going to be a Williams Advanced Engineering that are con- going to continue to supply the battery? Because we heard a few rumors about Remac competing for it as well. Um, I'd say there'll be, there'll be certainly the suppliers in the short term, and then hopefully um, one of the big battery suppliers, maybe the... Panasonic's or the Samsung's of the, the world. Duracell. Exactly. <laughs> decide to... Um, or the Tesco come. value batteries. <laughs> <laughs> yes, those guys might come along. We'll don't know about Tesco's, but we'll, we'll go to Duracell if they come. <laughs> uh, right, so question from Ross Curtis. This one is, who do you feel the team will... Oh, we sort of discussed this, but who do you feel the team will be fighting over over the course of the season? And where on the grid do you expect these fights to be? At the front or maybe slightly further back? Hmm... I there was a lot of reliability concerns, as you know, at the testing. So it was quite difficult to see who had um, solved reliability and the outside. It seemed that Team Aguru was the most reliable because they got the most laps in. Yeah, I think we were certainly the most reliable. It's whether or not we felt how much quicker the other guys were. And again, testing is so difficult because you know, theoretically, in testing, you're allowed to run underweight. You know, that's not the testing is not a uh, competitive event. So, you know, you don't have the FIA uh, weighing the cars, for example. So um, testing is always difficult to know exactly what levels people were running in power or what they were running um, or, you know, the tyres, I suppose. But you don't know what set up the cars were. Um, and that's why, you know, in any racing series, it's always difficult to tell with pre-season testing. We don't think we're too far behind. Um, we don't believe people have made huge gains. Uh, a lot of the gains have been 
let's say, hidden or confused by the fact that everybody's got more power. So, of course, we're one and a half seconds quicker at 170 kilowatts, just like you would imagine. Uh, because if you, you know, look at, if you look at a typical race weekend from last year, you'll see that in sessions one and two, you only run once or twice with full power before qualifying. And the difference with this series to anybody, any other series, it's quite dramatic. You know, you watch the, the times and then all of a sudden someone uses 200 kilowatts and of course they go three seconds quicker and you say, wow, that guy's quick. And then actually you say, no, no, that's the normal three seconds that they do go quicker when they had 50 kilowatts. So it'll be difficult to tell until really qualifying. And even then in qualifying, you won't be sure because now we have this one lap, you know, many people have could have made mistakes. So I think there will probably be um, one or two dominant teams, most likely the ones that are backed by uh, a car company because that's sort of a, what typically happens in terms of resources. So I expect that Renault will do a very good job and um, and as will uh, DS and, and maybe ABT. And then some of the reliability concerns that some of the guys had, it's hard to tell whether they'll have their... Um, with their reliability fixed by the first race. They are allowed to bring uh, new parts if they can get the homologation changed. That's part of the rules. So uh, you'd hope in the first races maybe you won't be so quick in qualifying, but we can certainly make up positions in the race as we did last year. We did quite a few good drives. Um, so And then the, the energy management will one of the one of the other uh, key areas. So... As we saw last year, there was a huge variance between how people saved and used energy, and that could still overshadow any gains that a, that a team has made in performance. If it was F1 and it was all computer controlled, then maybe that, that you know there would be a bigger difference in in performance. But in this series, where the drivers it is a lot down to the drivers how much energy they can save, it'll be more difficult for those um, for those uh, drivers then. And the differences the driver makes could be um, enough to uh, change the outcome for a team. We said, obviously, you know, the reliability at the beginning of the season. And, you know, that could play, that could give you some big points, you know, to know how it goes at the beginning of the season. But towards the end of the season, say, latter half, when we get to Paris, Berlin, um, maybe when we go to round five in March, you know, when teams start to get to grips with their new powertrain, do you think, you know, what can you do? I know you said with McLaren, you know, you were competitive with McLaren in 2003, but, you know, you know but once they get their powertrain sorted out, and maybe, the, you know, you expect a manufactured powertrain to, you know, for a second season upgraded version to eventually outperform the first year's powertrain. So what do you think you can try and do in the second year to try and keep, com- second half of the season, sorry, to keep competitive, to try and keep, keep scoring some points? A lot of it will be down to, as I said, the, the drivers and, and learning the energy stuff. I mean, what's completely different to Formula One, for example, is the power isn't limited in Formula One, whereas it is in this series. So what we have is, a, is really a, a completely different conundrum, let's say. And because the, the power usage over a lap is fully controlled by the driver, again, we have something that's completely different to any other series. So you have these natural limits. You've got the peak power you're allowed to use. Maybe some of the guys can be more efficient, but the driver still has to manage that power over a lap. So we can still be very influential on training the driver uh, over a lap and getting their competitiveness at the track sorted. Aerodynamically, everyone's the same. I always say that um, motor racing speed is about engine aero and tyres. Error is the same, tyres the same. So we will look carefully at tyres, as we always have done in every other series we've raced in, and we'll look very carefully at aerodynamics. Power of the engine is limited, and power sets top speed. Top speed is very is proportional to power, um, and therefore, again, there'll be some efficiency differences, so you may find someone is slightly better in a top speed, but a lot of the parameters are, are, are controlled. Um, dampers are free, so we can do work on dampers. Wheels are free, out of interest, which you saw pre-season. Mahindra was playing with some different yeah. wheel offsets. Um, so there's a lot of... And then software is, is free. So uh, there's a lot of freedoms that, are, that we have that everybody else has. 
and batteries are the same and the car's the same pretty much everywhere else. So this is a slightly different series than than many others because of those parameters. And um, for me, it'll really just come down to total resources. Who's got the total, more total resources to do more things? There's always something you can think of to optimize. So um, a lot of it will come down to the total resources that a team has. Our very own Joe Jones has uh, sent in and said, how are you approaching funding a manufacturer? Uh, do, do you really have the money to keep up against the likes of Citroen? And and do they have exciting any... Yeah, I'll start, I'll start that again. Yeah, he's and put about they, four and, questions together here, sorry. <laughs> uh, and, and, and do they have any exciting new sponsors coming on board? I also want a driver's announcement. <laughs> <laughs> um... It's always difficult to compete with a car company, but as you can imagine, we're we're also looking to get um, partnerships with uh, OEMs. That's one of the my key goals is to to look at a partnership um, with OEMs. You got very close as well, didn't you, before this season to being the knife manufacturer? Yeah, I mean the the manufacturing wise, that's a little bit different to what that question is, because the only real OEMs are. Um, Citron and um, Renault. Uh, it depends on how you see the ABT relationship. I don't quite understand that one. Um, and then, of course, you have Mahindra. But um, that's what I consider the real OEMs, the ones with more resources, not just not just money, but um, resources through their R and D centres. Um, you know, Citron obviously has a a great. Um, a uh, deal of experience in racing in in um, in WRC, and of course we all know Renault has lots of experience in racing from everything from two liter Renault to obviously Formula One. Um, so it's not just about money; it's also knowledge. And we're also obviously trying to work on partnerships with with OEMs and other big technology partners. Um, and that's the name of the game. You know, we'll all we'll all keep working on that, and we'll all keep working on trying to find partners that um, that match with us. So yeah, that's that's pretty much my job at the moment. And as for drivers, of course, by the time this podcast goes out, everyone will probably know who the drivers are. Yeah. But, um, so can you tell as, us? But, <laughs> no. <laughs> Jack, no well, reporting. All we can make right now are a couple of educated guesses. <laughs> Ready for fan boost, as we said. <laughs> just, uh, just a question, because I'm. Um, because uh, because we because uh, I heard about um, uh, Felix, uh, Antonio Felix de Costa, who was one of your drivers last year. Uh, he, uh, he he said the DTM was his main priority, but then when the dates changed, he, he said he came back and said, "Oh no, I, w- I want to race him. I want to race him for Formula E now." And um, so uh, so 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 have you been in talks with him or not? He, I don't think he could comment, Jack. Yeah, better not comment on anything. Yeah. Just uh, in case. <laughs> all I would say is that I don't think those are conflicting statements, Pico, because um, I think even if he would make come back with Formula, and this is entirely speculation, I think his priority would still be in the DTM, and if there were any clashes, he would have to miss the races, and a substitute driver would have to be used. And of course, bearing in mind the new rules about driver changes, which means you can only use two drivers per two driver changes per car per season. I think. So that means you have a maximum of three drivers in each car, I believe. Yep. Any any thoughts on that? That's true. Yeah. Oh. yeah. <laughs> Nailed it. Nailed it. Great, <laughs> Yeah, I think people got very fed up with the driver changes last season. And it was a lot of them were circumstantial, like you know the driver would get caught taking drugs or something, and <laughs> or they. <What's> would, like <laughs> yeah, or they would um just. Look, they had other commitments elsewhere and they just couldn't commit to the full season. They wanted a more regular driver. All sorts of, mainly just kind of circumstantial. I don't think anyone really tested this for the sake of it, putting like six drivers in the car over a season. No, indeed. Yeah, so anyway, that's the end of our, our questions now. So I guess we've got, we move on to our last segment, which is Beijing and what we can expect there. And then we have to say goodbye. So, um, so, uh, and does anyone have any 
you know, big predictions they think is, is going to, they, they really want to see or they really think they um, might see in Beijing. Hmm. I'd like I to see Trilly do a few more laps. To me, <laughs> they, one, w- w- once they got their engine working, I think they did do a few laps on the final two days. But, but what I think one of the big shocks of testing that uh, 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 that we saw was um, uh, Next EV because they because they are the champions, not not constructors wise, but um, but uh, but drivers wise, they have got the they they've got the drivers champion, but they never got the ball rolling for quite a while they only really got it rolling last couple of days and they still weren't that quick so well i mind they've done a lot of private testing as well and that went much smoother yeah. for them prior to donnington yeah and so yeah uh, yeah I, but i wouldn't put um next ev in the frame uh i'd say apt and ezams uh uh, I I I shove a Gory up in there as well as maybe Andretti. <laughs> well, you they, have to. You have naturally. to. I was going to say you can't just like not exactly. get a Gory. <laughs> yeah. And maybe Virgin as well, and maybe all the teams. To be honest, I genuinely have no idea. Yeah, it's, so, it's yeah. amazing. That it still feels really open after even after one season and all the yeah developments that have happened since. Uh, I think Mark might agree with me in those last two days where we had the rain towards the end of the session where the track could have been at its best really didn't help anyone sort of you know find out who could be quick or you know, no one really went for a proper 200 color well people did but in terms of you know full let's go for an actual qualifying simulation lap I, I wish it I, I, we also I had limited it, times too so yeah I I, I wish it rained on the day that I went there. It was just too <laughs> hot that day. It was something that it, it was in the twenties and it was horrible. <laughs> that just proves how British I am. You were in London when it rained, though, weren't you, Picker? <laughs> yes, but yes, but the thing is, down at turn thirteen, it has been raining since the start of qualifying. Yeah, but where but where I was at the first uh, at, at, the, at the chicanes. It started raining after. Um, uh, sorry about this, Marco, but uh, but but after it started to rain properly there after Sakon's uh, crash. It did indeed. Yeah. That's why I don't know. We talk about London, but it was kind of like I, I don't want to digress too much. It was kind of like Spa I had that river feel. It's like it's raining at one yeah. part of the circuit. The final sector was so wet, and the first sector was so dry. I was yeah. like, this park is so small. How is this happening? <laughs> Uh, well, you know, wandering about it, it feels a bit labyrinthian at times. But I want to talk a little bit. I, I do have one question about Battersea that I'd like to put to Mark. Uh, but uh, before I, do, I just want to do, make my quick predictions for Beijing. I think that is, um, it, is the question: Are we going back there? <laughs> yeah, kind of. It was more kind of should we go back there? Sort of, hmm. which, I want to, which I talked a lot about in the last podcast. But um, uh, Beijing quickly. Uh, Edams are going to be quick. Apt, apt, Chief Laudi will definitely be quick as well. Uh, DS Virgin, a few question marks. They say they could be as quick as Edams, but uh, I think I think they'll definitely be up there. Uh, but whether they'll be in front, it could depend on whether Sam Bird or John Vern can get a really good lap in and qualifying. Yeah. And um, and yeah, as as for Team Magoo, uh personally, I I see them just behind that group, perhaps sort of with the. Uh, Fifth, fifth or sixth quickest car. I think. I think, in terms of, I'm just just being that's honest. Still rather good. That's, that's still rather good. I, th- I think. I don't think that will stop them. I think they could still be in contention to win races, though. I, I, yeah. still think. I think. I think anyone can be in contention to win races, as it proved last year. And yes, we have this new development, but it's still so close, as we saw from testing. You know, times yeah. between the Mahindra's Venturi's Dragons were separated by only thousandths of a second. Um. So it's going. It, you know, it's going to be. Super interesting as well. It is indeed. So my other question about Battersea itself, and uh, don't get me wrong, I really like liked going there. I really love the race itself. But in the last podcast, we talked to Paul, who is a resident of Battersea, and he was um, he had some very strong views, and a lot of them were backed up by uh, his own experience, I guess, and also what he knew about um, what he'd been looking into about the um, organization of the race and the build day. But I, I feel a little bit like um worried about the opposition that's there and I feel like maybe that maybe we should be at least considering some of the other venues in London, like uh, XL, for example, put forward a, a they put forward a venue 
it was kind of a, a weird indoor outdoor circuit. I haven't seen any track maps of it. But... I haven't. I I didn't even know that it. I didn't know that it went indoor. I had no idea how they were going to make the track there. But so, I'd love yeah. to see if if anyone has a copy of this so called XL track down there. Yeah, I, I, I really need to contact them about that. I I, 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 I can't make tracks in XL. I usually go for Photoshop. <laughs> I, I don't know what they were going to do, if they were going to rent out an exhibition hall or whatever, but um, I, I definitely feel that there are a lot of questions that need to be answered in or, terms of these alternative London venues. Uh, yeah. And definitely... My or, track. My track in the Queen the one, Olympic Park. Yeah, OK. Um, just just put it out. Yeah. Well, that, well, that is one of the... Um, but my, my worry, really, is that in creating this opposition, which, you know, intentionally, or, or, or I'm pretty sure it's not intentional... It's just, it's just, um, they, these residents have been rubbed up the wrong way. I'm worried that we are going to be creating, we, we're sort of going down a route that we don't really want to, and that we could be sort of, I don't, what I really don't want is in five or six years' time, we look back and say, oh, we turned these protesters against us in London, and that was what killed the championship. I really don't want, I really don't want that, you know, to have that sort of sad story playing out, so, um, I'm not sure if you have any sort of thoughts on on that, Mark. But um, I, I think as long as Alejandro does his job, that's that's uh, that's his job to figure out how to get to fix so all obviously the problems. Obviously, because it's, it's nothing to do with you, because obviously you're just you turn up and race. I mean, it's not really your responsibility at all. But I think he'll do a good job. He always does. Yeah, he's a good he's a good guy. Hmm. The residents need to be convinced of that. Yeah, is the only thing. Well, uh, it'll be all right. I'm sure. Well, okay, we should find out in November. Finally, yeah, definitely. Something should yeah. happen November twenty fourth. I'll be there. <laughs> right. So anyway, I guess I guess that's everything. So I have to say, Jack will be doing autographs there. Yeah. Now, now, <laughs> now he's advertised that he's there. He's just going to be there with a pen, just like waiting to sign everyone. <laughs> I may be going to. So um, I have to say a really big thanks to Mark for coming along. I'm, I really liked having you along and um, for the ride. <laughs> Short yeah, though, maybe. And uh, thanks for taking up your time. Thanks, Keith, for organising. And, and to Team McGurry, wish you all the best of luck for this season. And we really hope... Uh, good luck to your drivers, whoever they may be. Yes. <laughs> and uh, really think, we really think we want the end of you know, a really good season. We'll be covering it and supporting you and the other teams because we have to be at least partial. Semi-biased. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but, yeah, thanks as well to you, Pico, and to you, Jack, for coming no on as well. And uh, thanks to Dad for getting me this new microphone. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, uh, I guess uh, um, all that remains is when, when should we do the next one? In, in, a, in a couple of weeks' time, I guess. Yeah, Be- after Beijing. Be- Beijing review, Putra Drive preview rolled into one. I think that would be a good. If we one, can, yeah. if we can fit it in. Uh, yeah. yeah. Anyway, Indeed. it's really exciting times. Uh, really hope to, um, to whoever you are watching right now that you really enjoy what you see in Beijing. Uh, Mark will be in charge of this, so if um, his cars do something you don't like, or they do something that they that they do like, go tell him on his <laughs> Twitter account, which is uh... <laughs> Mark Preston Street. Yeah, it's a. Uh... <laughs> Sorry, I, I, that was the worst lead-in ever. <laughs> my Twitter account is. Um, I'm at... just going to turn my mic off now. <laughs> my Twitter account is at Edward J Hunter. Uh, Jax is at Jack Jordan Mana, and Picos is. Um, at Pico F1, is it? Yeah, Pico, Pico Motorsport. Motorsport. Yeah, P- at Pico Motorsport. Uh, of course, there's the FE Addicts account, at FE Addicts, and the Formula Addicts Facebook page, where we do all sorts of things, including like the questions for this, which we you get forgot, there. You, you forgot Formula E Zone. Oh, yeah, Formula yeah, E Zone. Just putting that out there so that Jack, so Jack doesn't forget. So, thank either. you, Pico. I wasn't really that bothered, okay. but yeah. Cheers. Anyway, so no that's it for now. We wait to see what happens in Beijing. Thanks for listening. Goodbye.